Welcome to Weekly Strange News. In this show, we take a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will place all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Hello and welcome to all of my first-time viewers and listeners, everyone catching this live, and of course, those catching this on repeat replay so james paul welcome nicholas scarlet trucker jonicide so good to see you guys what's going on before we get started please hit that like button right down below as we do three live shows right here on this channel subscribe and hit the notification bell as well as we cover topics such as ufos the paranormal and things that are unexplained so for the first article we're going to be covering is about the government and UFOs. That's when it gets juicy, convoluted, difficult, and very interesting. So I'm going to share my screen here because this one you really want to listen to in detail. And it's actually so intriguing that I'm reading it directly from the Department of Defense Office of Inspector General website, okay, a government website that was published January 25th. So here it is. Because Inspector General Robert P. Storch, this guy that we're looking at right here, announced January 25th that the DOD OIG, which is the Department of Defense Office of Inspector General, released an unclassified summary of the previously issued classified report evaluation of the DOD's actions regarding unidentified anomalous phenomena that was released to his little cabinet of people back in August of 2023. So here today, we're hearing about this six months later. This had never made the news until rather recently. So what is this report saying? So the report reviewed the extent to which the DOD, military services, defense agencies, and military department counterintelligence organizations took intelligence, counterintelligence, and force protection actions to detect, report, collect, analyze, and identify unidentified anomalous phenomena, aka UAP. Then it says here, which is a quote, by the inspector general stating given the significant public interest in how the dod is addressing uaps we are releasing this unclassified summary to be as transparent as possible with the american people about our oversight work on this important issue hold on to that little paragraph because you're going to see the irony just a little bit later then it continues on the same website it says <clears throat> As the unclassified summary explains, the DOD OIG found that the DOD does not have a comprehensive coordinated approach to address UAP. For example, the DOD OIG determined that DOD components developed varying processes to collect, analyze, and identify UAP instances. <clears throat> The DOD OIG also found that the DOD's lack of comprehensive coordinated approach to address UAP may pose, dun dun dun, a threat to military forces and national security. For instance, the DOD OIG determines that the DOD has no overarching UAP policy and as a result, it lacks assurance that national security and flight safety threats to the United States from UAP have been identified and mitigated. That's the bulk of it. There's only one other paragraph, but what it's saying here, making that into a big fancy word salad is, yeah, we don't really know what's going on. Point blank stop, period. Okay, that's what we're getting from this. And it's like, we wanna be as transparent as possible. So we're gonna give you a really quick summary of a paper that we wrote back in August for you saying that, our military, our government is decompartmentalized. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And because we don't have a real good protocol on how to handle UAPs that everyone can get a hold of, we don't really know what's going on. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I ain't buying it. This has been going on since 1947, maybe even prior to that, prior to Roswell. For them just to come out and say, oh, I'm so sad. I don't know what's going on. Oh, you know what? No, I, I don't get it. But I do want to state that this is very interesting to get people's eyes on for even the DOD OIG to just address this. I think in a, in a positive way, 
that's pretty cool. Like we are getting somewhere. Now, if you're a pessimistic, and in this case, you know, I'm feeling I'm feeling a little bit pessimistic. Yeah, I, I I still don't like it. And it's only several paragraphs on on the government website. But from what I read to you, what do you think about it? Am I misunderstanding this this report that was just published January 25th? Or do you think I'm in the right ballpark here? It does continue to state that to address the issues identified in this report, the DOD OIG made 11 recommendations to the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security in coordination with the director of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, ARO, aka Dr. Kirkpatrick, the secretaries of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. For example, the DOD OIG recommended that the DOD issue a policy policy to integrate roles, responsibilities, requirements, and coordination procedures regarding UAP into existing intelligence, counterintelligence, and force protection policies and procedures. So they're saying, in this case, 2023, you know what, guys? It's getting pretty whack in here. You know what we should do? We should all have a collective meeting and talk about UFOs. You are a little bit late, but if we look at the timing here, this was published in his little cabinet of people back in August 15th, 2023. We're looking at less than a month right after the UAP hearing with Grush, Graves, and Fravor that they gave it at at the Pentagon. Um, so I think that the timing is crucial. It's very important to look at. And then for them to say what I just read to you, I'm smelling something kind of fishy here. And last time I checked, I'm not making any seafood at my place. So what's that fishy smell? It's the story. But what I have to ask, and I got to know in the live chat, I got to know in the comments as well, what are you thinking about this? And Mark Tesaka. Thank you so much. And Mysterious Mysteries, that's a pretty sick name. It says disclosure will not come from the government. You are right. It will come from the people. But let me mention this. And I mention this pretty often when it comes to our conversations about UFOs and the government because it's a catch-22. It is a double edged sword here where people will not listen to a report or a credible story if it doesn't come from a military official, from a pilot or someone with like really high credentials in the government, right? Compared to your average Joe walking down the street, you have a higher chance of believing that military official than maybe your Uncle Sam, for instance. Do you see what I'm saying here? Some are going to say, well, I don't, Christina. All right, you're not in that category, but the majority of people are. And then the government has the biggest audience than any, any, anyone else's platform. So they are going to influence people to feel fear, to feel inspiration, to ask questions. And so for them just to address this for the last, I would say, year about UAP, UFOs, and all this, it's a really good start. A lot of people's minds have been open since the beginning of 2023. And I'm going to say, we got to say a little, a little thank you to the government just talking about this, ARO, the UAPTF, the AOI MSG, when all that information was public just a few years ago, it was because of them. But will disclosure come from the government? Will the government say, guys, aliens, they're here, they're chilling with us, we signed a contract, or they're living in our White House right now? That will never, ever, and 99.999% chance that will never happen. Now, I got to leave that 0. 0.000001 for the extraordinary because as Justin Bieber once said, never say never, but I believe he must say that all the time now. However, we have to have that, just that little mindset of positivity, optimisticism, and say maybe, but no, it, for the most part, you're right, mysterious mysteries. <laughs> so I do want to ask, what you are thinking about this. Android says, Corbell says he knows several whistleblowers are ready to come out if government won't do it themselves, aka catastrophic disclosure, aka forced disclosure. That's going to be interesting to see who's, who, who they're going to bring to the table. Now, there are a handful of other people that have mentioned that there will be more whistleblowers. Um, James Fox is one of them. The person who's the creator of the public, his name is Michael, and his last name escapes me, has also spoken to a handful of whistleblowers that 
he mentioned that will come out in the near future. 2024 does seem like a very promising year, and there are a handful of people that are, quote, in the know that are mentioning, yeah, whistleblowers will be coming out. And was it because Grush set a foundation for more people to come forward? Or was it Lou Elizondo? Was it someone prior to that? Depends on how you see it. Depends on your perspective. But it's going, 2024 has been interesting so far. I am looking forward to see what else is in stock for us. Thanks, Toilet. Appreciate your optimism. I appreciate you for watching these shows live. You're pretty cool. All right, getting into our next one as you let that one digest, because when we talk about the government, it's always meaty, but there's nothing there, like a nothing burger. It's it's the irony is definitely there. But we're getting into our next one, still kind of keeping our focus on the United States here, because there was a survey that was done by Wealth of Gr of Greeks of Geeks.com. And this is an article or a survey that has kind of made its rounds online in the last few days, asking a thousand Americans, which is your your concentrated pool of answers. And they're saying, what do you think about UFOs? What do you think about aliens? So here are some of the questions and go ahead and hit that like button, or you can even uh, raise your hand if you agree or disagree to these things. So it says here that one in three Americans think aliens are living among us in disguise and many suspect their boss, according to a new survey. I feel like that's oddly specific, but you know what? Some bosses, they're brutal. And some of them are just like, flat out creepy. So the research of 1,000 Americans show that 37% say they feel aliens may already be present here on Earth. Raise your hand if you agree. Raise your hand if you disagree. I want to know. And from sightings of 10-foot tall aliens in Brazil, the jetpack miners, <clears throat> to the recent refuted extraterrestrial corpses found in Peru, or the tourist board of Kentucky beaming messages to space to invite aliens to visit, which I didn't cover this. This is about, I think this was, this was two weeks ago. A small town in Kentucky were beaming out these messages into space as a tourist attraction because it's so small. And I was like, and it's kind of lame to cover, but for the New York Post to cover this, I'm just going to kind of give you a little background on what they meant by that. And then you have the interest and debate uh, around alien existence. It continues to fascinate, and it has been prior to 1994 when the first, quote, exoplanet was discovered, which when we're looking, and I'm going to get back to this because this has been bothering me today specifically because I have a few other articles talking about space exploration and then dwelling on 90, like the early 1990s and the first exoplanet. I'm thinking, what's going on here? But we're going to get back to that particular thought in just a moment. So 41% of those polled disagree with the notion that extraterrestrial life may be walking and talking among us with the remainder of unsure being 22%. Now, that 41% has never gone to Walmart, especially at like the middle of the night. You will find some of the oddest people there. No question, okay? Doesn't even matter what part of the country you're in. And if you've never been to Walmart, go. It's 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 a time worth remembering. So, the out of this world findings, as they always say, emerged from a survey conducted by Talker Research on behalf of wealthofgeeks.com. When asked who they feel may um, currently be an alien, 39% stated that their current boss as a definite possibility, while a third said they feel a certain celebrity may not originally be from this planet. So let me throw this question to you. Out of all the celebrities that you can think of in your mind right now, which one do you think kind of gives off these extraterrestrial vibes or have extraterrestrial characteristics? And do you even know any extraterrestrials to compare them to? I want to know. Because I, there's probably a few that I can think of that I'm thinking, mm, maybe an alien, probably, and that one definitely. 
But more than half of the one hundred of the one thousand polled believe in the existence of aliens, being fifty three percent, while a third do not, being thirty four percent. And in twenty twenty three, it just seems twenty twenty three. We're in twenty twenty four now. What the heck am I saying? In twenty twenty four, it seems that if you don't believe in extraterrestrial life and that the planet Earth is the only place with intelligent life, you're in that category of just like naive at this point, maybe a little bit ignorant. Now, if we were to say the same thing in the 1980s, 1970s, yes, we would, you and I would be in the category of the naive and ignorant, maybe of believing in extraterrestrial life. But now science has been coming in strong and saying there's definitely a high possibility. And now understanding how big our universe is, how there can be multiple universes, the multiverse, maybe even parallels as well. And we're looking at all of these factors, just us. It's a lame. 10 out of 10, lame. Now, men are slightly more likely than women to feel aliens exist, according to the results, being 56% in men, while 49% in women, which I thought was an interesting statistic there. I didn't even consider that as being a possibility, but now we know, and this is only based off of a thousand Americans, which is really a small poll, honestly. How do they pick these people? Which is like one of those odd ads on their website, maybe they say, hey, check out your personality. Like, what's your zodiac sign and your personality? Kind of that. Is it those kinds of polls? You see what I mean here? Or did they get an email and say, you have been chosen to be a part of our statistics? I have never gotten those emails now that I think about it. And you know what? I feel a little upset about that. No, not really. Actually, I hate reading my emails. And so with this, where do you stand on the fence? Where are you? Do you believe in extraterrestrials? Do you think there are some celebrities that kind of give off extraterrestrial characteristics and or vibes? Hmm? 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 Tell me. Tell me. I want to hear it. And if so, who do you think that is? I got to know. And I want to read them out loud. Okay, so pass them on over. And Robert, thank you for that. It's so good to see you. Okay, let's see. Team Believer says Jenna. Heck yeah. Mysterious Mysteries says, those pulling strings are non-human, not celebs. Ooh. Interesting. Oscar says, I believe 100% extraterrestrials are here, here on planet Earth. Rome bringing in some, some, I mean, he did play Doctor Strange, okay? Benedict Cumberbatch, all right? Now you're saying Chamber can, but I only know of Benedict Cumberbatch, and I feel like he had just like kind of alien kind of features, skinny, small eyes, you know, kind of deal. That's just me. Mel Gibson. Okay. Elon. Mark Zuckerberg. All right. Interesting ideas. I knew someone was going to say Taylor Swift. Like, I just saw that one coming. So, while you're still kind of dwelling on that one, Tucker Tries says, go team. Ooh. Let's, let's get those, like, uh, number one foamy fingers. Go team. Yes, we need one of those. Jeff Bezos says peace. Well, someone, I forgot who said Elon Musk, because actually that's going to be our next topic. Jets, you can see the future. You are able to foreshadow what is coming next because we'll be mentioning Neuralink and its first human implant of the brain reader device that has been in the works for a very long time. Elon Elon. Elon has not received a lot of positive feedback when it comes to Neuralink, at least when it comes to your mainstream media. Now, behind the scenes with other scientists, it's a little bit, a little more unknown. But when we're looking at our media aspects to this, they're saying, nope, this is an awful, horrible idea. But Elon is taking the approach that Neuralink more than anyone, it's supposed to benefit those that have paralysis, those that cannot, that are not able to use their limbs. Maybe they don't have limbs, but they still want to use technology. So they're going to integrate this neural link chip into their brain in order to 
act within the world like you and I do a little bit more uh, without limbs or if you do have paralysis. At least that is the take that he is going for. Now, is that the case? Technology all depends on who has their hands on it. It can be positive or negative, but that one really just depends on the person. So let's get into this one. This one is, it's interesting. It really is. That's why we're covering it today. So the announcement of Elon Musk about Neuralink's first human implant of a brain reading device marks a significant milestone in the development of brain computer interfaces, also known as BCIs, as we will be referring to it throughout this article. Because BCIs are designed to decode brain activity, enabling individuals with severe paralysis to control devices such as computers, robotic arms, and wheelchairs through thought alone. While Neuralink is not the only company developing such technology, its entry into human trials has generated both excitement and concern within the neurotechnology research community. But we have to ask, how was he able to even like get this to be legal? He had to fight significantly with the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. And there was a very long period of time between 2022 and 2023 where they were wholeheartedly against it. He had to do the research on mice and then on monkeys. And when those proved to be prevalent. For instance, there is one video that has made its rounds across social media for the last year or so of a monkey playing like digital ping pong using Neuralink. And so now it's being done with humans, with our first human already in trials. And according to Musk's Twitter post, it says that he's recovering rather well. Here it is. It says the person who wasn't identified is recovering well, Musk said on X, aka Twitter. And, and it says here, initial results show promising neuron spike detection. And this is referring to the cellular, cellular activity between our brain and our nervous system. If Musk wasn't going to do it, it was going to happen anyway. At Someone proved me wrong, but at some point in the near future, we're going to end up being cyborgs. We're going to so deeply integrate into technology. I would probably say within the next 25, 30, 40 year time frame, we will all have this in our minds. Now, some are going to say, oh, not me, not ever, but a hand a good chunk of people will, and it's already starting in 2024. So this was already in the human timeline with or without Musk. It was going to happen. And very specifically, now that we're seeing the, just the th incredibly fast development of AI in the last 18 months, okay, like we have seen AI develop right in front of our eyes so rapidly compared to any other generation looking at another piece of evolving technology. And look at us. We, we, we have Alexa. We have it on our phones. We have ChatGPT to like do your papers, okay, and whatever else you might use it for. Now it's already – then you have VR goggles. Then you have VR reality playing those video games. While those are currently external, there are people that are like, why can't I have this all the time? Here's Neuralink bringing you that for you, and it'll be made public, like for public, I wouldn't say consumption, but like to buy <laughs> in the near future. When I'm saying near, I'm going to guess if I, if I had to guess and I'm like not a great guesser and I don't gamble, but if I did, if I was a betting man, I would say within the next 10, eight, eight to 10, eight to 10 years, people will, this will be on the market like more freely available. But I got to ask you, what do you think? Am I, do you think eight to 10 years is too soon for it to be on the market? And I'm not asking for your aspect of fear, but I'm asking for in the aspect and your opinion of how things are going so far. Do you think it will be in the market sooner than that in five years or much later in 25, 30 years? Hmm? Let's hear it peace of mind says self-driving cars. We're already getting those. Those are crazy. Jess says, 
no assimilation for me. No thanks. Yeah. We, we don't want to be like the Borg. No. That, that one's pretty spooky. Like, I remember watching one of that, like, whole section of Picard where he was going through that assimilation process with the Borg. It was scary, especially during the time it was created and filmed. I can only imagine how much fear probably created inside of people. Now we watch it today and we're like, <laughs> that's funny. Low key, your reality. But back in the day, man, ooh, like it's a little spooky, kind of like Terminator. Okay. It's it's there. I robot with Will Smith, also slightly terrifying. Mysterious says, I want an implant where I can just connect my brain to the internet. That'd be pretty cool. And I think Neuralink is going to achieve that a few, along with a few other companies as well in the near, in the very near future. Mark says, within five years, it'll be widespread. I'll be hiding in a van down by the river. You know what? Fishing, living your best life, you know, actually like going out in nature. That's going to be very rare if it isn't already these days. You'll be living the actual dream. So this article in particular has a lot more information. And it also mentions here that the news um, come months after Neuralink began recruiting potential human test subjects for its clinical trial. The company got the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, approval for the trial last May, saying it wanted to enlist people ages 22 and above who are living with a quadrupe quad quad Dripplegia? I'm not saying that right, but that are in paralysis, okay, due to a spinal cord injury um, or dealing with ALS, the disease that robs people of the ability to control their bodies. And if you've ever encountered um, someone with ALS, it's really, really, really depressing. My mom had a friend who actually passed away with ALS and it was, it came to the point where like they can't even use the restroom on their own. They can't sleep on their own because they could like suffocate. Um, it's, it's really terrible. So like when you have that mentality of wanting to help people and have them not be isolated from the world, then Neuralink and this chip could be so amazing. You, you can see the beauty in it. But if you use it for people's demise, then you say, oh, humanity is doomed. That's it. Bye bye. But from this perspective that Elon is going for, he's like, I want to help people. At least that's the narrative. Now, is that true? We have to ask him. So the device aims to record the activity of individual neurons, a method that requires electrodes to penetrate the brain. And this goes into a lot more detail on the scientific aspects of it. You will be able to read it on your own time as that link will be in the description box below once this live show is over. So we're going to get into our next one. We don't want to dwell on, on the sad and ALS here. And, and John aside, I'm really sorry to hear that. It's, it's awful. Like there is nothing good about that. So next we're talking about space, space exploration. My goodness, that picture is poopy, but we're going to go for it anyway. And this is the Europa Clipper mission. Why am I breaking this up? Two reasons. One, there was recently an article written about it from space.com, but also yesterday in the show about the Chinese mysteries, we did touch on the Europa Clipper mission. And I just wanted to kind of give some more information on that because it is so fascinating, especially when we're dealing with one of Jupiter's, um, one of Jupiter's 92 moons that could potentially harbor life as it is seems to be based off of the science that we have an ocean world with miles and miles thick of ice. But once you get down there, could there be jellyfish? Could there be dolphins and, and regular fish and who knows whatever else, right? That is why the, the Europa Clipper mission will be launching a little bit later this year and will be, and will actually get to Europa in the 2030s. I think it's no earlier than 2030, which 
you know what? I mean, that's such a long time from now. But in terms of space and, sp and space exploration, that's pretty quick. Now, remember a little bit earlier, I mentioned to you the first exoplanet was found and recorded, at least publicly, back in the early 1990s. We've been sitting on space exploration, space news, space development for the last 30 or so years. That's not even a person's lifetime. Could you imagine, okay, for a moment here, you're born in the 50s or 60s, okay? And then the 90s come along. And before you thought, nope, there's only our planets, our solar system, and that's it. And then bam, here comes the early 1990s. And then you are thrown new information by, I'm going to assume here, NASA. And they're saying, guys, guys, you will not believe what I just found here. Oh my goodness, you are going to flip the flippy out. And they're like, what's going on? It says, guys, I just found an exoplanet, a planet outside of our solar system. Therefore, we will call it an exoplanet. And now I must re-question my life's existence and ET existence. Now, since the 60s and 70s, we have been throwing stuff out into space, hoping to find something outside of in our solar system, outside of our solar system. And then the early 90s came and they said, guys, I found, I found the goods. And then ever since then, we are finding exoplanets every few days, every few months, either way, pretty significantly to the point where we've racked up about 5,000 exoplanets that have been recorded. Now, why am I bringing this up? Why is this significant? Because when we're looking at the UFO phenomenon and these stories of extraterrestrials have been going out and have been integrated in our, in different cultures across the globe for not even centuries, but at this point, millennia. And then for 93, 94 to come around and they say, guys, we found an exoplanet. In, in some ways, it doesn't match. Now, of course, our technology has grown significantly, but every piece of tech that has been blasted into space or even telescopes easily take 10 to 20 years to create. And at that time, it is your highest, most amazing piece of tech. And then a new one comes along, which we're actually going to get into just a little, a little bit. Take another 20 years. Do you see what I'm saying here? I do not see the... It doesn't match... Now, someone correct me. That's okay. I love, I don't know everything, okay? People would classify me maybe as a little bit naive, and that's fine. But if you have an answer to my question, please tell it to me, but also explain how you came across that information. Don't just tell me, oh, Christina, you're really dumb. That's not the answer. But tell me why it's not the answer. Okay, I love that. Also, your comments are not only valuable to me, but they are valuable to everyone else that reads them as well. And Cassidy, thank you for that. That is so nice. Thank you. So now we're going to get into the Europa. Now that I have passed over my tangent, because my goodness, it has been bugging me since early this morning. And I'm like, oh, I don't know who to talk to this about because no one gets it but you. You get it. This is why you watch the show. This is why you listen in, you tune in. If I were to call my mom, she'd be like, Christina, like, what are you saying? And I said, mom, you don't get it? No, mijita. No, no entiendo. And I'm like, okay, mom. All right, thank you, bye. But you do. So getting into this Europa Clipper mission, which in many ways I have to say is pretty exciting, but the spacecraft prepared by the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, is equipped with nine scientific instruments and a telecommunication system. And these instruments are cu crucial for the mission's objectives, including a mass spectrometer to analyze the composition of gas molecules on Europa, a structured dust analyzer, and an imaging spectrometer spectrometer to study the moon's ices, salts, and organic molecules, which I think is really cool. But here's also this information, because additionally, the mission will utilize cameras to capture wide angle, angle, and narrow angle images of Europa's surface, providing detailed visuals of its icy landscape. Now, here's what I would like. I would really like for the cameras to be on the entire time it is launching through our solar system all the way to Europa. Like, that would make me so happy. Now, is that going to happen? At this point, I don't think so. I don't. There has been a delay in the Europa Clipper mission, as it is honestly for all of NASA's projects. There's 
always a delay. It never launches on time. That went for Juice. That's going for Europa. That's going for all of the all of the Artemis programs, so on and so forth. It's just this reoccurring trend to the point of, look, if you don't know if it, when it's going to launch, don't even promise that it's going to launch, okay? Just don't even say anything. Let it be a surprise or something because the disappointment is there. And this is no exception to that. But the Clipper suite of instruments will work in uh, synergy to investigate the moon's subsurface oceans and its potential for supporting life. For instance, a spectrograph will search for water vapor plumes and analyze changes in the atmosphere, while a meg magnetometer and a plasma instrument will study Europa's magnetic field and its interaction with the ocean salt water. And then at some point, if all that seems promising, they will drop down a some kind of probe or a drone to start drilling into the ice of Europa, and then we'll get the actual goods, okay? We will hopefully see alien fishies and jellyfishies and whales and dolphins and all that good stuff. That would, that would be like the highlight of my life right there. Also a bowl of ramen is also always my highlight, but that'd be really cool. So while we're still in the conversation of space exploration is that there is a new observatory that's going to be kind of like coming on the market, coming online, and it's called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, also known as the HWO, represents NASA's new ambitious step in space exploration following the James Webb Space Telescope. And here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the trend. We see Spitzer, Hubble, the JWST, and now this one. Almost every single one almost, says, we're going to find life. We are going to find evidence of life. It comes online. No, we didn't find anything cool, but let me show you these beautiful pictures of our galaxy. Isn't it just stunning? Aren't we in like, it's the most beautiful place in our universe, but nothing other than pretty images, right? And then here we are with this name, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, that won't come online for another 20 years. It was first kind of, the information first came out in the year 2020. And so then when this one comes online by the year 2040, they'll say, oh, yeah, this one's going to find life. And it's not going to find anything. Oh, you know what? We just don't have the right technology for it. We don't have the goods. Uh, let's publish the next one called the Alien Finder Telescope. That one's going to give us the goods. And then that one comes online. And it's just this same routine, the same pattern, none of them giving us the information or the evidence that they said that they would. But when you are sensationalizing it, yes, you are going to get the proper funding for it. And is that what this is all about? So while this is very exciting, the Habitable Worlds Observatory that will take about 20 years to make and create, are we actually going to get anything other than pretty images of gases, of nebulas, of planets, which are beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I love seeing them. They're, it's, it's always a fun surprise. But when they promise us one thing and they say, oh, but actually look over here. I used to be naive on this. And I'm like, yeah, this is so awesome. But after years of looking into this stuff and doing the research, I feel like I've become just a little bit wiser. Not a lot. Okay. But just a little bit to say, come on, guys, really? But either way, on the optimistic side, this is still pretty cool, okay? Maybe this time, I could be wrong, and they will probably promise us the goods. Now, will they? <laughs> My hopes are very low on this one. <laughs> yes. No, today, today, a little bit less trusting. Yes. I, I think um, there's a few agencies and organizations that we have covered here on this channel that just fail to meet their own expectations every single time, that my expectations have gone even more below the bar than before, to the point where I have almost no expectations. Um, but I would like them to beat them and say, oh, guys, guess what? We brought something really good. And I would say, yes, yes, this is awesome, versus getting incredibly disappointed when they do not bring what they promised that they would. Ron says, our next 20, 30 years will be fascinating indeed. 
I'm with you on that one, okay? I have to agree with you there in many aspects, not just in space exploration, but also in technology as well. We are three says, bet your boots on the goods. Oh, yes, I love Bill Nelson and, and that quote that he gave out during his NASA media briefing back in April. That was a garbage Okay, briefing on UAP saying, yeah, we don't know anything. We need more funding. But he says, we can be transparent and you can bet your boots. And my, I want that on a shirt so bad. It's amazing because the irony is there. But I've never heard it since. And I've never heard it before Bill Nelson saying that. So I love him for that piece. And also, this image was really pretty. So. We're getting into our last article, and this one, we got to bring in the slight comedy here. We got to bring in the funny jokes, the, the 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 funny articles, and so I came across this one that I loved, and it has to do with like your emergency calls in the UK. I believe it's nine nine nine, and in the United States, it's nine one one. And so here are just a handful that were recorded by the dispatch department of like some of your craziest 911 calls where they shouldn't have called them. Here it is. It says caller. And here it says, I have a bottom part denture and I want to clean my teeth. And I said, where's my false teeth? And this sounds crazy, but I don't know what else to do. Could I have swallowed my false teeth? The operator says, so you don't know where your false teeth are. Okay. That's really short. It's really sweet. But my question is here, if you lost them, what is what is the police, the fire department, the hospital, what are they going to do to fix that? How are they going to fix that? Are they going to come over and you're going to play like hide and go seek with them? You know, it is a crime. It is, And I'm going to assume it's a crime in the UK too, that if you just call for a joke or something like that, you will be fined. At least that is the case here in the United States to the point where I am terrified to call 911. Um, even if it is an emergency, they can just say, no, it's not. And then bam, I have like a $10,000 ticket in my mailbox. Okay. That, mm -mm. That's not really how it works, but sometimes my brain goes slightly to the extremes here, but here's another one. And if you love kebabs, Ooh, this one's for you. I love kebabs. They're delicious. Ring, ring. Hello. Tell me exactly what happened. The caller says, yesterday evening, we had some kebabs and I might have had just a little bit more than I'm used to. And then this morning, I had a very painful stomach. We've been out at Thanksgiving dinner and I think I just ate a little bit too much. The operator hangs up right there saying to themselves, just because you have a little tummy ache, you don't have to call 999. 911, wherever country you're in. Call your mom. Okay. Take some tums. Rub your own tummy. Surprisingly, that does work. If your hands are warm and you rub your own tummy, man, it works wonders. Don't call the emergency for that unless you have like a full blown hernia in there or you're actually coughing up blood, then maybe. Otherwise, go take a nap. Now, this one, this one's funny and terrible at the same time. We'll keep the same image here. Actually, I'll just change it. Oh, no, I do have the image. Yes, here, here it is. So it says, ring, ring. <clears throat> my ring is stuck on my finger, and I think I need to cut it off. Operator. Is your breathing normal for you? Caller. My breathing's fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> Are you bleeding or vomiting blood? I'm not bleeding, no. And you don't have any pain? Yeah, just, just a little bit. From the information that you've provided, you do not require a more detailed assessment by a nurse. So an ambulance will not be sent to you at this time. Um, but how, how am I going to get there then? Can you just come and see me, please? We live in a world now, okay? We're just slightly more entitled than we ever have been. When your finger is stuck, you can still drive your car, okay? Your coche. You can drive it, and you can take yourself. And if there's really any issues, you call a friend. And if you don't have any friends, you call a taxi, Uber these days, okay? 911 cannot help you. Maybe they could, but you really want to cut off your finger because a ring is stuck? Soap, butter, okay? Lard. 
works wonders on your when your finger is stuck inside of a ring. Now, some of them are pretty serious, okay? To be fair, some of them are pretty bad. I've come across a few stories. But for the most part, soap will be your friend. Now, I have one more for you. This one is is pretty funny. And it's getting your hand stuck in the mailbox. <laughs> I've never had this happen, but I think it's hilarious. <clears throat> Operator. Is the, is the patient awake? Yeah, it's me. My hand's stuck in the door. Is the door locked at the moment? Yeah, it's locked. Mom! Mom! My hand's stuck in the effing letterbox. How, how old are you? Open my door. My hand is stuck. And the operator hangs up the phone there as well. And why is that? Because the operator's asking himself, how old is this person? Because it sounds like a very silly child. Now watch it be like a 30-year-old that knows exactly what he's doing when his hand is stuck because he was trying to steal mail from his own mother's home. Mail these days just get junk mail and bills. And at this point in 2024, you need to do like a paperless statements for your bills. Like, honestly, you really shouldn't be getting mail these days unless it's like coupons to get your oil changed, <laughs> which I do always look out for those. Okay, those are kind of good. <laughs> but those are my articles that I have today, keeping the funniest for last. But out of all the articles that we covered, please let me know which one was your favorite. I think for my case, it was really interesting to hear from the DOD OIG where they had mentioned, yeah, we don't really know what's going on, but we, we did a report back in August and now we're trying to be as transparent as possible. And you can bat your boots here that uh, we don't know what we're doing. Thank you for that, DOD OIG. Man. And I pay you with my tax dollars? <laughs> Cheers, my friend. Man, you are living the dream. I just sent over my taxes, okay, to my advisor. And I just, if you are a tax advisor, like, bless your soul. Bless your heart by every means. Because my goodness, is it just like, unless you love math. But if you don't, man, it's just awful. And then everyone's always depressed. Like there's never like positive thoughts or like good feelings about filing your taxes ever. I have never come across a person that says, you know what? I love filing my taxes. You know what? It is so much fun. If you do, you are a blessed soul. Okay. You're just naturally happy all the time. And I want to be you so bad. But for your average person, like you and I, there's nothing good about doing your taxes except not going to prison. Okay. I, I do love that aspect. Very important. But let me ask you, which was your favorite article for today? Okay. Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments. I do try my absolute best to read all of the comments. Cindy says, taxes are fun, but not for everyone. Feel like that 1%. Maybe if you're lucky. <sighs> Um, I will say I did take a power nap before today's show. I think people are like, did you drink a lot of coffee, Christina? No, it was, it was a, it was like a 30 minute power nap. And I almost thought I was going to miss the show, but I made it. And here we are with a little bit more energy than I anticipated. But you know what? Feels good to just like be awake instead of half asleep. Don't you think? And sometimes coffee doesn't always fix those issues. A nap. Oof. Works every time. Well, almost every time. Ron says, power naps are great. Yeah, they are. And so it turns into like an eight-hour nap. And that's just like full-blown sleep. But that is it for today. Um, here is the QR code to scan all of my social media links. And also, I'm now starting to write up articles for all of the shows that we do right here on this channel. I am a little bit behind kind of catching up from last week being out of town, but those will be up by early next week for um, all the shows that we did right here on this channel this week. So you can find it on my website. Um, if you just scan the QR code, you will find all the links right there. But if you're listening, to this on a podcast platform follow me on twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news and also on instagram at strange paradigms if you want to continue the conversation bring it over to the discord server with three thousand other like-minded members share your thoughts your insights your experiences and more i want to say thank you to absolutely everyone watching this live all the super chats super stickers youtube members patreon supporters and of course all of my amazing moderators you know i cannot 
not do this show without you. For all those that stuck around, all 300 extra viewers, you are amazing for sticking around. But let me put in this shameless plug but it's not shameless because it's my own channel and that is if you need help falling asleep relaxing meditating or using your own imagination to wander in the universe take a look at my music channel which is called cosmic portals there i make space ambient music that i make by myself all on my own so if you need help relaxing or meditating do take a look at that and that qr code will take you straight there that is it for today i will see you next time be safe and remember keep your eyes on the skies.